Hello, I'm Neil Ferguson, the Millbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the chair of the Hoover History Working Group. Uh, it's kind of a home game uh, for us uh, today. We've got our very own executive director, Manny Rincon Cruz, presenting his latest work, uh, which is a, really a kind of potted history of uh, Chinese uh, money uh, going all the way back to the imperial era and coming up to the present. Uh, this is a applied history in the best sense. Many people today are intensely preoccupied with the question of Chinese monetary innovation, the digital currency, digital renminbi or yuan, and electronic payments on platforms like Alipay and its WeChat equivalent. But as Manny argues in his new paper, uh, to understand what China is doing today, you really have to go back uh, into history uh, to trace the roots of, of Chinese central banking and China's modern monetary system. Uh, the title of the paper, Dollars, Digital Currency and 120 Years of Chinese Central Banking, Manny, uh, welcome uh, to uh, uh, the Hoover History Working Group, which you helped me run. Uh, let, let me kick off with uh, a question. Uh, you argue that a lot of the discussion that goes on today about DCEP, digital currency, electronic payments, is unhistorical and, and misses uh, central themes, uh, certain paths of Chinese history. Uh, give me an idea of what you mean by this unhistorical discussion and, and what it is that, that people are missing when they talk about, about these issues. Thanks, Neil, for, for having me and giving me the opportunity to share this research that I've, that I've done. What I refer to as the ahistorical or unhistorical assessment of DCEP is really the focus uh, in the United States and Europe on what a lot of us perceive as the offensive kind of aspects of a digital currency. Uh, and those refer primarily to the ability to evade uh, US financial sanctions, uh, to Chinese surveillance and censorship, right? If all transactions are sort of digital, um, you know, protests like the ones that happened in Hong Kong would be impossible, uh, as well as to the dethronement of the US dollar as a reserve currency, as a settlement currency. And then lastly, sort of the penetration of Chinese tech companies into the rest of the world, into emerging markets like Latin America and Africa. I think that history provides a different framing, which is not as externally focused. I think a lot of this is a little bit navel gazing, right? We, we have these concerns about policy. I think if you look at the origins of government and central banking in China, they've all been consistently driven by an agenda of self-strengthening. And this latest project, DCEP, is really part and parcel of that agenda. It is uh, driven in part by a desire to raise the technological sophistication of the domestic economy and then to guarantee the party's control uh, and ability to harness those resources. So I, I think that's, that's the driving domestic agenda for DCEP. I think everything else is kind of, you know, they're very important side effects, but they're not the primary motivation. So the paper really has three parts. Uh, uh, it's chronologically arranged, and you start in the in the imperial period, the late Qing period, when this concept of self-strengthening had a very specific meaning. Talk a little bit about what happened then and the debates that went on in the late Qing period about what kind of a monetary system China should have. Yes, um, we have in the imperial era, the, the Qing Empire had just suffered uh, massive disruptions from the Taiping Rebellion. They had just suffered defeat at the hands of the Japanese Empire in, 19, in 1895. And there, that's when the concept of self-strengthening arrives, when the Chinese elites realize that they have fallen behind in terms of new technologies for war, right? So railroads are a big problem. Uh, they're mostly foreign funded and foreign controlled. They're afraid that this will lead to the division of the country. There's iron and steelworks, which are related to this. There's shipbuilding, there's telegraphs, and then there's banking. And so the debate really centers uh, about the establishment, it's really about the establishment of the, of the Imperial Bank of China. And it's a debate that's borne out in palace memorials between two officials, uh, Sheng Xiong Huai and Jiang Zedong, who's, 
very famous. And the debate is really about the powers that should accrue to the Imperial Bank of China. Should it issue a, a, a standard unified currency? Because China has no national currency at this point. Uh, is it able to transmit and remit taxes? Is it able to extend loans? And the two visions are quite different. Zhang, who represents kind of the conservative, uh, a little bit more of a conservative side, really believes that the bank should have a limited set of responsibilities that accrue to it, and none of those would make it a central bank. Sheng, on the other hand, thinks that all these enterprises, right, from railroads to war making, uh, you know, shipbuilding and, and iron and, and telegraphs should all be funded and managed by this imperial bank. And so he sees it all as a unified whole. And that's really the debate that happens, uh, which is of course ended when the empire itself ends in 1911. Now in the, in the next phase of your story, a bunch of Westerners uh, turn up uh, with uh, what they see as uh, the right kind of uh, institutional framework for what is now a Chinese Republic. Tell us a little about that, because it's uh, it's actually in some ways uh, uh, a precursor of, of a more recent uh, period when uh, Western economists offered uh, Chinese reformers ideas. It is, in fact, a very interesting period. It's it's highly unusual, right, in the sense that a 37 year old Princeton economics PhD gets uh, picked to be the head of the financial sort of internal reform team in the nationalist government. And, you know, this this follows a long tradition of American economists and some British economists going abroad to other countries to set up central banks, even though the United States did not have its own sort of central bank until 1913. These were the and money so, doctors, as they were sometimes known, uh, you know, really the sort of uh, antecedents of Jeff Sachs, uh, who used to fly into Eastern Europe with, uh, with blueprints for uh, economic salvation. Yeah, and it was a lot easier back then, you know, uh, the key economist in the Chinese case, Arthur Young, he later sets up the central bank in, in Saudi Arabia, but I've seen in the archives, he just wrote it out in pencil and one sheet of paper, and then the king threw him a party. I mean, it seems like the job was a lot easier, uh, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, but what happens within the uh, nationalist uh, bureaucracy is that you have this group of specialists and, you know, a lot of them are Chinese that have PhDs from Harvard and Columbia um, that really subscribe to this standard central banking model of, you know, a, a, a reserve bank has reserves from the commercial sector to modulate the level of credit and money, uh, where the goal is to fight inflation, where the currency is backed by gold. Uh, and it's fully convertible. Uh, it's not backed by silver, which is a traditional Chinese monetary metal. And on the flip side, you have, uh, you know, Chiang Kai-shek and his brothers-in-law, uh, you know, Song Siwen and Kong Xiangxi. And they subscribe to the nationalist uh, sort of ideology, which is very close actually to the, so, uh, to the communist one. And they believe that the, the economy needs to be industrialized by the state and the state plays a very important role in development. A lot of this is the product of a close advising by Soviet advisors, in fact. And so we kind of have this oscillation uh, in, in the reform project where the specialists really want to set up the standard bank. By the way, this is in 1936, so the Great Depression has already started. The US has gone off, you know, everyone has broken convertibility. These people are still pushing for full convertibility and, and you know, sort of gold peg. Um, and then of course, you know, Japan then declares full out war uh, against uh, China, which then shifts the balance of influence in favor of, of Kong and, and, and Song. And so the whole banking system is nationalized in, in fact, and kind of unified underneath the nationalists. And ironically, that's actually what's inherited by the communists as the banking system. It's already state controlled by the time they take it over. And this is one of the things that you taught me uh, back in the days when we were colleagues at Harvard, that, that actually the Maoist regime uh, that comes to power in 1949 inherits institutions that have already been uh, nationalized and doesn't actually have to invent uh, a Soviet-style system because it can essentially just adopt the nationalist version. Uh, so, I mean, I'm assuming in my naive uh, way with 
a deep knowledge of, of Chinese financial history that uh, there's not a big uh, story to tell about the 1950s. The regime essentially follows Soviet models of, of planning with all their shortcomings and limitations. Uh, the third part of your paper really is the, the recent past and the, the debates that have been going on in China since Deng Xiaoping's uh, policy of opening up about uh, financial liberalization uh, versus the more recent uh, trends towards uh, digital currency and electronic payments, which seem to go in a different direction. And as you argue, uh, somehow back to the future, back to a, a time when the state controls uh, the, the economy through the central bank and through the monetary system. That's right. I think that, you know, the current uh, phase of uh, you know, this, this focus on digitization and, and digital currency is in fact kind of this like weird uh, stepchild between the Soviet inspired Maoist system and the reform process that took place uh, in the 1990s and then the 2000s under uh, Zhou Xiaochuan and, and uh, Zhu Rongji. Um, so as a quick summary, really uh, the Maoist system, you know, when we talk about a Soviet system is one where the bank does not function as a bank. Uh, it's mainly a tool for uh, the surveillance of economic activity and disciplining of enterprises to make sure that they're following the state uh, plan, uh, economic planning. And so there's a system of accounts between enterprises. Uh, they can only transact with each other, and that's how the, the bank kind of keeps track of that. And then there's uh, cash currency, which is distributed to farmers and you know normal people like you and I. Uh, through wages and we deposit that in, in deposits and sometimes we can't take it out. And so that's the Soviet system in, in a nutshell. In the 90s, there's a period of reform where you have folks that have, you know, professional expertise in economics. You know, the current bank governor, Yi Gong, he wrote a textbook in the early 90s about reform. Zhou Xiaochuan was, a, you know, has extensive academic training. Uh, you know, Liu He, uh, the premier also has the same. And what they do is they unbundle the bundled uh, system that they inherited from the nationalists. So the big four state banks uh, get broken out. The PBOC in 1995 is designated through the central banking law as a true central bank whose purpose is to promote economic development and uh, financial stability. Uh, they really gain a lot of leeway after the 1997 Asian financial crisis when they don't devalue the renminbi. And because uh, the Ministry of Finance had really uh, messed up, uh, really botched the recapitalization of the state banks. They were making a lot of bad loans. They try to recapitalize them without truly reforming them. And so bad loans piled up in the early 2000s. So the PBOC then steps in and you know, a lot of the reforms of the last 20 years are really PBOC driven, um, where they take shares, they, they make these into true shareholding banks. They take a big part of it. They get foreign investors, other financial institutions like Bank of America, uh, Wells Fargo, so on. Um, these uh, are then helping to transmit expertise back to the banking sector to kind of get market discipline and get real credit analysis. So that's, that kind of brings that to a close, I think, at uh, you know when Xi Jinping takes over and then Yi Gang takes over. And what happens in that point is that Yi Gang is now less powerful than Zhou Xiaochuan was during his term, right? He now reports to Guo Shuqing, who's a party secretary. So the PDOC has become kind of subordinated. And Xi Jinping really brings about what Elizabeth Economy calls the third revolution, which is the sort of recentralization of power and the focus on this self-strengthening kind of agenda. And this is why I say it's a weird kind of like hybrid stepchild from both eras. Um, the digital currency system, right, is follows the two-tier system that the Maoist pioneer, right, between enterprises and then from enterprises to retail. It also has at, at its core the ability to track all economic activity, things that the Maoists could have only dreamed of, right? They had to deal with these rivers of paperwork and it never quite worked, but now it's possible. Uh, but at the same time, there's a strong influence left over from this latest era of reform because uh, you, know, you have a lot of banks that are now more commercially based. The government thinks that the market mechanism is in fact very important at promoting growth. And so I don't think that is going away, but it, it is a weird mix between the sort of the, the Maoist futurist dreams and then sort of the latest era of commercial reform.
what we had in the course of our discussion a notable intervention from a uh, uh, recently retired uh, US government official making it clear that at least for some people uh, in the United States today, what China is doing in the monetary realm poses a really major challenge because if nothing else, technologically, China seems to be leaping ahead of the United States. Uh, so your paper allows us to see the nature of the Chinese challenge, I think in a, in a much richer historical context and, and perhaps as you said, uh, not to misconstrue it uh, by making the mistake of thinking that it's primarily directed against us when in reality it represents a, a return to a vision of financial control of the economy with uh, with very deep roots in, in Chinese history. Manny, it was a fantastic paper, a terrific presentation, and uh, all I can say to you is hurry up and publish it because many more people need to know this story. Thanks very much. I will. Thank you so much and happy holidays. <laughs>